Oh, let's just give it a second more, make sure everybody's getting in. Um, and then we'll get started. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have like a PowerPoint or anything that you need to share? Or are you just gonna nothing formalized for this? Okay. Yeah, just for this, I thought it'd be like a, a casual like Q and A. Um, I have like topics prepared, but I sort of wanted to see what all of you wanted to discuss. Perfect. I have tons of questions. I always do. Okay. <laughs> yes, if everyone be thinking of questions, please. Yeah. So let me introduce you real quick. Um, I am going to read a little bit of your bio, but uh, not all of it. So I highly recommend everybody. Um, uh, checks it out, somebody. Okay, cool. Oh, there's a question already. <laughs> so, um, all right. So we're going to welcome Dr. Jenny McClay to our final masterclass. We made it. Yeah, this has been one heck of a series, and this is a perfect way for us to, to cap it off. I think Though if I had asked them to anybody to play one more week, they would have gone on strike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is wonderful <laughs> that you're you're going to be speaking to us about um, kind of self promotion and, and entrepreneurship and music. Um, so um, Dr. McClay is a Van Doren artist and clinician, and has enjoyed a very diverse career as a clarinet soloist, recitalist, orchestral player, chamber musician, pedagogue and blogger. Uh, currently, um, or just finished up, uh, she was the visiting instructor at clarinet, of clarinet at Brandon University in Canada and was visiting lecturer of clarinet at Iowa State University in 2020. Online, Dr. McClay is known as Ginny Clarinet, which is the same name as her blog, um, which I have used actually before we even met, used in some of my curriculums, and I used it as a resource to program many of my recitals. Uh, it's an extremely popular blog, but I also have the distinct pleasure of working um, under her coordination as she is the social media coordinator for the International Clarinet Association. I've learned so much. I learned how to do Instagram stories, and I applied that knowledge to Facebook, um, all because um, Dr. McClay taught, we spent a meeting, and she was such a good teacher about how, how to do that. And, um, so, in addition to teaching and performing, Dr. McClay is also interested in traveling and researching clarinet cultures from around the world. To date, she has visited and performed in over 30 countries, and she enjoys meeting other clarinetists during her travels. Oh my gosh, I can't pronounce half of this stuff. <laughs> so, I highly... You know what, some of the places meet her can I, so... <laughs> so, I highly just re recommend that you all take a, a gander at uh, her bio, which is on our website. Um, but uh, let's just turn it over to you and talk a, just talk a little bit um, because you're a master of self-promotion and social media and getting the word out on things. Um, so there's already questions in the chat, but I'll turn it over to you. All right. I'm so excited to be here and congratulations to all of you for making it through the semester. I know this last year has been rough to say the least, so you all deserve a very heartfelt round of applause for everything that you've been through this last year. So it's not a round of applause, just one person, but thank you all for everything you've done this last year. Yeah, so there we go, a round of applause for all of you because I really, I know that everyone has been through some rough times this last year and I respect all of you for being a music student and doing music in one of the wackiest years in um, recent history. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say that, but I'm really excited to be here. And as some of you might have heard, this is just sort of a casual Q&A type session. I do a lot of social media. I do blogging. Uh, before I start answering some of these great questions I see already, I'll just tell you a little bit about how I got started with social media. Um, it's not really a fancy story. I grew up with social media, so it was very natural for me to use it. I did MySpace. I don't know if any of you, I, I'm sure you've heard of it, maybe in like only 90s kids remember. Um, then Facebook came out. That was what all the cool kids were doing. I did Facebook and I used the name Jenny Clarinet on my Facebook instead of my real name because I only wanted my true friends to find me. And the ironic thing is, is that I started getting friend requests from people around the world that played clarinet. And so I started accepting friend requests from everyone that looked like 
a clarinet player. And I quickly gained 5,000 friends. And that's when I started doing a Facebook page. I made a blog and um, started doing all of this just because I wanted a way to share some of the things I felt about clarinet. I started the blog Jenny Clarinet in 2015. I've had Facebook with Jenny Clarinet since Facebook came out for the general public. And so I sort of built an audience on Facebook and they migrated over to my blog. I'm trying to think what else would be useful for you to know. Started the blog when I moved to Paris in 2015. I did my master's at the Versailles Conservatory there. So it was a nice way to blog and use as a resource for my students. I was teaching online before it was the cool thing to do. Um, I've had an online studio since 2013 just because I've been traveling a lot. And the blog I felt would be a great way to give my students a resource and then anyone else that wanted to find it. So I gained a large following through that. I also do Instagram, um, not as much some of the other um, platforms like TikTok, <laughs> I don't actively participate in. I love watching the TikToks. I think there's so much creativity there. I have a Twitter, um, I haven't tweeted in several years now. So I'm focused mostly on Instagram, Facebook, the blog. I have a newsletter that I write every week. So um, other than that, I guess I will start answering some questions. We could take this in any direction about musicpreneurship, being a musical entrepreneur, social media, personal promotion, digital marketing, anything that you want to know about, feel free to ask in the chat, raise your hand. Let me just catch up with some of these questions that we already have. Let's see. So the first question I see from Chris, um, with everything that's available on YouTube that people can see for free, how does a musician, artist, manager, music, marketing, rep, et cetera, handle this so that people get paid for their recording efforts? Is there something already in place to manage this? There are a few ways, and I, I have my own thoughts and opinions about this, and I encourage you to all explore your own boundaries because this is a touchy subject. We all deserve to be paid for everything that we're doing. Artists should never work for free. But I think for a while, at least when you're first starting out, you have to say yes to your fair share of unpaid work. This is what I think, what I have done. And I got a lot of this from one of my social media gurus that some of you might have heard of. I will chat his name. It's Gary V. If anyone's heard of that, he's a social media expert. And he wrote this amazing book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. And the idea is that you jab like boxing terms, but through social media by giving out free content and building a brand and building a reputation. And then you throw on a right hook and that's when the audience should do something for you. Maybe they buy your latest recording. Maybe they sign up for an online course. Maybe they um, become a Patreon or something like that. So that's the philosophy that I've tried to give is most of what I do is online and it's free to the general public. And then I'm hoping that my loyal fans, when I need something from them, like signing up for a newsletter or buying one of my boot camps or digital products, that a lot of them will convert and do that. So that's how I make money is through the following that I've gained whenever I do online courses or anything like that, then that is what has worked really well for me. But it depends. I certainly don't see anything wrong with charging for what you're worth and what you've done because we know how many hours it takes to do a decent recording and then to put that out there on YouTube. So you could consider starting a Patreon page. You could consider doing all kinds of other revenue streams. And that's something that all of you should answer for yourself according to your own comfort level. Let's see, I hope that answered your question, Chris. And Chris, it looks like there's another, Chris D, maybe it's a different Chris, another question. I think I heard from a podcast that you learned a great warm up sequence from Philippe Couper. Yes, um, so in Paris, I studied with Philippe Couper and he kicked my butt at everything, but especially the warm ups because he doesn't necessarily believe in using books. And that blew my mind at first. There are a few major differences between the European 
clarinet school and the American one. And one of those is we're very book heavy here. I am too. I love books. I love Behrman, Kreps, and all these classics, the Rose Etudes. And they do over there too, but I'll never forget the day I walked in and I asked him how he practiced scales. What's your scale practice routine? And he laughed in my face, not in a very mean way, but just, it was incredulous. Like, I, I don't use scale books. I just, I practice my scales. I do seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, sevenths, octaves. I do arpeggios. I do diminished. I do augmented. And that is really his warm up routine. I um, have been saying for years I should write that out, but he said that for about six months he would spend three hours a day practicing scales and all these patterns and every key signature. So um, that's how he has incredible technique. I think there's something to be said about this level of technical ability, but also having to think of all these exercises in your head instead of just reading from a page. It really makes you a better sight reader. I think you absorb the key signatures a lot better. So if I ever do write out that routine, I'll be sure to blast that everywhere on social media just because I know that it's going to be very difficult, but it's all going to help us. It's sort of like eating vegetables. If you don't like vegetables, you know it's good for you, but it might not be the most palatable at the time. What other questions do we have? Or does anyone have any topics that we want to veer on to? I see, yes. I have a question. I have so many. Um, okay, so you were talking about the, the you know, the things that you, create revenue for you. So you offer a lot of free things. Your blog is free, but then you, you expect then something from the audience. Uh, and one of the things you mentioned was uh, boot camp. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the classes that you've come up with and, and some of the ideas you've come up with to create revenue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the boot camp started in 2017 and it comes with a very embarrassing confession. And that is that I had never finished the Behrman scale book. I, I had worked on it for years, but I was one of those people, I would do some C major, F major, some A minor. And then when the going got tough around like D flat major, B major, I would say, oh, you know what? Like F major needs a lot more work. Let me go back to that. Let me go back to this key signature. <laughs> and I had never finished the book. And so I created a practice plan to finish the book in 30 days. And I shared it on my blog and I called it the Behrman Bootcamp. And there was a big following. It went clarinet viral, which is not the same kind of, you know, normal viral content online, but um, it went viral in the clarinet community and a lot of people joined in with me. So I made a Facebook group and we would share fingering tips or advice or just commiserate together on Facebook. And that was the first boot camp. And since then I've done boot camps or these regimented practice plans for all kinds of other books. I think I have close to 30 that I sell on my website, but I also have a lot of free ones. So some of my favorite warm-up books like the Fritz, Kre Fritz Kretsch um, 416 Progressive Studies, um, the Ool Bootcamp, there's a few others I'm probably forgetting. So I created these for myself, but also thinking that they might be useful for other people too that wanted more structure in their practice plan. Besides that, um, I'm trying to think of other digital content I've created. A few ebooks, clarinet quick fixes, tips. I'm working on a clarinet trivia book right now. And I've done some online classes. Last summer, I launched what I call the Ginny Clarinet Academy, which is sort of like clarinet university online for all of the subjects that you might not get as a music major because they're very niche subjects, one of which is music history, but for the clarinet. So the clarinet's history, because a lot of the books are very expensive. They're out of print. Maybe your school library doesn't have all of them. And over the years, I've built up this collection and I created sort of the best of clarinet history compilation with all of the important repertoire, the important players, um, performers and things like that. So I taught clarinet history. I had beginning intermediate and advanced class clarinet for maybe like middle school or high school players that wanted to join. Um, a few weeks ago, I launched some more for the summer. One's called Turbocharge Your Technique. The other is Sculpt Your Sound. So anything I think would be useful for people that are looking to supplement maybe what they're getting at university or in their band program. And I'm always trying to think of new ideas to offer just to help the community because at the end of the day, you do have to make a living, but the reason that I do all of this is because I enjoy writing and I 
I've been really blessed to have a lot of opportunities that I know other people haven't. So I try to give back as much as I can just because I've been really lucky to have traveled and studied with some pretty amazing people. So I want to share the wealth as much as I can. Yeah, we got one here. Sammy has a question. Um, how do you balance all of that along with like teaching your students in addition to like creating all of this stuff? I, I wish I had um, a, a better answer to guide all of you. Um, the answer is I don't have free time and I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> so it's not a healthy answer by any means. I will own up to that. Um, I was teaching at Brandon University this semester and I also have a private studio with about 20 students. So I would teach on the weekends. I bookmarked Friday. So Monday through Thursday this semester, I was teaching at the university. Friday through Sunday, I was teaching privately. Um, I get up really early and stay up really late to blog, to write other ideas. I try to find pockets of time. When I first started the blog, I was commuting from Paris to Versailles. So I would type the blog articles on my phone and then edit on the way back on the train ride. It was about an hour and a half longer if there was traffic or rush hour. Um, it was a Metro. I wasn't driving and blogging at the same time. <laughs> I was taking the Metro so I could do that. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer. I'm trying to get a better work-life balance, but the truth is, is I enjoy it. So a lot of times that's part of the problem is blogging has never felt like work because I genuinely enjoy learning more about the clarinet. I'm the biggest fan geek you'll ever meet. Um, in my spare time, like in my leisure time, whenever I have any, I enjoy reading clarinet dissertations on the internet and I, I am that dork and I'm, I'm very proud of it. So it never feels like work when I'm researching things for blog posts or learning about new repertoire. I genuinely enjoy that. So I, I would say that's a pretty important piece of advice for all of you is to find something and some outlet, some medium or platform that you really like. That's why I still blog, even though I know that videos are probably more popular today. I don't do a lot of YouTube. I do like recordings that I post on YouTube, but I'm much more comfortable writing, which is why I don't do like TikTok or videos of myself explaining some of the things that I do on my blog, just because I wanted to be a writer long before I even picked up a clarinet. So it's perfect for me to write and express myself that way. But find the things that make you genuinely happy and then figure out the best way to express them. I'm giving other people. What other questions? Yeah, I have a question. About, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, are there more on, I, any other? I have so many. I had an experience about a year and a half ago that uh, something you said in your introduction sparked interest and this leads to kind of promotion on self social media um i went clarinet viral and i don't know why <laughs> i didn't really do anything but all of a sudden one day i was getting like two to three hundred clarinet friend requests every hour <laughs> Um, from all over the world and I didn't really do anything with it because I well I accepted some and then I was like this is overwhelming and so I, I, del I started deleting them um, but uh, the thing that I'm struggling with is, is it has started up again it's kind of revving back up and um, I started I have this professional page you know where people can like it but nobody seems drawn to that what are some things you would recommend so that I can have a personal page that I don't have, you know, 400,000 clarinets from all over the world messaging me being like, greetings from Austria, um, and still interact with them with my own personal page. What are some of the ways that you balance? Do you have like a secret personal page? Um, that's tricky. So I would say it depends on, I guess, what your goals are, but, um, my way, which is not the right way or the only way, but I had my, my personal like Jimmy clarinet Facebook profile long before I had the page. I actually made a Facebook page. I think this is just a very great way to show how the times have changed. Back in 2009, I was in college. I made a Facebook page called Jenny clarinet and I got a lot of, um, 
negative feedback from people in the clarinet studio at my school. I'm like, who do you think you are to have a Facebook page? And that, why would you do that? And I think that's so funny now because who doesn't have like, you know, a clarinet TikTok or Instagram or like something for self-promotion. So um, one of my biggest regrets is I deleted it because I listened to other people instead of just keeping my eyes on the prize. Um, I think if you want to get more people to go to one place, if you're trying to get them from your personal profile to a page or to your Instagram or to what other platform, if they message you or reach out on one, I would say greetings from you know Wisconsin or wherever. Thanks for reaching out. Like feel free to like my page. And then if they want to, they can. But if not, they sort of realize that that's a closed avenue that you won't be responding to them there. Um, and I think that's a nice way to do that because. I know some people like to set very strict boundaries between their personal Facebook page and their professional page or like personal Instagram or professional Instagram. So it's about deciding your own comfort level. I still have about um, close to 5,000 friends. I started going through and deleting people. I think over the years, some maybe like don't play clarinet or maybe I was like too quick to accept every single friend request. So people that I genuinely don't think play music at all, I've started deleting those and they can choose to follow me on like my public Instagram or on my Facebook page. Um, but it, again, it's a personal choice. Um, but I think as long as they're aware of other places that they could follow and like, that would be the first step is making them aware of that and then trying to get them to convert to the other location. Something just popped in the chat. Okay, yes, let's see. Do you recommend a certain web host for web pages? How do you determine if you stick with something that is free or pay for access and a domain? So again, this depends on if you already have something, um, your comfort level with like website building. For what it's worth, I use GoDaddy for domain hosting, um, security, um, everything. I've gotten through GoDaddy. I've had really great success with them, but it's sort of like, what, what's your setup? What mouthpiece do you play? What clarinet do you play? It's personal preference. I know there are other great platforms out there. I do pay for everything just because you get more flexibility. So I know a lot of places offer free domains, but it might be like jennyclarinet.com slash blah, 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 blah. And I just want jennyclarinet.com and that comes at a price. So um, I would do a little bit of research and see which has the best deal for what you're looking for. When you're first starting out, you really just need domain and hosting privileges to get through, build a decent website. I will say it's a lot easier now than it was when I started. Maybe it's just because I've learned along the way, um, which brings me to another important piece of advice. Don't let not knowing things hold you back because when I first created my website, I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about building a website. I spent about a month straight on YouTube tutorials, how to build a website, how to purchase a GoDaddy domain, how to encode this, how to do this. Literally 12 hours a day, I was on YouTube. Everything I was trying to do was all because of YouTube tutorials. So if you want to do something, you have all these great ideas, you have the energy and enthusiasm, but you just don't know the, the nuts and bolts of doing it. YouTube, Google, they will be your best friends. So um, besides that, the other services that I use for my weekly newsletter, I use MailChimp and had really great luck with that. I've used that about a year, love that. Um, that's about it for the website. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other services. Make sure if it starts taking off, if you really want to invest in that, I would recommend getting security and some protection. So I've had some like spam problems this last year. I splurged for like a really nice protection plan. It has daily backups of the website. I also pay for an SSL certificate because I'm selling products on my website. I want to make sure that it's very safe for anyone that's giving payment information that nothing happens to that. So um, it does take a fair share of research to make sure that you're following all of the laws with everything, even like a website, um, you have to make sure that you have cookies enabled and you have the right verbiage, you know, saying how you're going to use people's information for newsletters. I had no idea that you have to list an actual address. So I got a PO box so I don't have to use my personal address. There's a lot of details, but it's all available online. So don't let that put you off doing any of these things that really interest you. What are, oh, what are some ways that you 
redirect traffic? Like, have you redone your website? Like, I'm building a website now, um, and I worry, you know, in five years I'm going to want to redo it because I'm new at this and I'm just learning. Um, how do you redirect people? How do you, if say you decide you don't like your website anymore, what do you do? Just change it, really. It's easier than it might seem at first. I don't know how you're building your website, but I'm guessing it maybe it's like a theme or like a template where you're not like coding everything from scratch, right? That's correct. Yeah, I've built, I've actually had an easier time with less restriction. I feel like the template is stressing me out. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, see, that's why it's such a personal preference for everyone. I know um, with anything, no matter how you do it, you can change, it's stressful. In fact, last summer I had a meltdown because the, um, the theme that I was using on my website, I'd used it from the very beginning and they chose to no longer update the theme and it wasn't compatible with the latest version of WordPress. And I had a rough couple of days, you know, struggling with that identity of like changing my website. It's not a big change, but I had to change it. So I just finally decided on a different theme and you don't really have to do anything except download the theme and then just sort of work with the layout a little bit. It doesn't delete any of the data. So nothing is permanent in websites, but back everything up. That is the most important. So anything you have, back up the entire website, but also the content on the website. All of my blog posts, I save as Word documents and save those to an external hard drive because that's the most important. The web design doesn't really matter for me at least, but all the content that I spent hours and hours of my life, if I lost that, it would be heartbreaking. So um, experiment around and see what options you like, sort of spend some time with the layout, sort of the navigation, the pages, but realize that nothing is permanent. And if you get stuck, there's always web designers. There's YouTube and Google, yes, but there's also paid professionals that do this for a living that could probably do it a lot quicker than you could if you're really busy and you just want to hire it done. There's also a lot of people willing to do that for really reasonable prices. Um, have you had any, I don't want to say legal issues, but are there like copyright things you've ran into or have you had to be like licensed as like a separate company or have you run into any legality issues? I haven't. No, I've been really lucky in that sense. Um, I would say to just learn as much as you can about everything. I would say something that sort of threw me for a loop in the last couple of years, there's I forget the, the proper title, but like cookie law. So I had to have like pop-ups, you know, this site uses cookies and had to make sure that I had a privacy notice. Um, and I spent a while Googling that, like with a newsletter, there were things that I had to just brush up on. I'm not allowed to, well, anyone that has a newsletter is not allowed to just sign you up for that. Legally, that's not okay. So if somehow I got a list of all of your emails and then you receive the Jenny Claire Courier on Sunday, that's illegal. I would never do that. So just knowing everything that you can and cannot do. Um, but I, I try to be overcautious with things. So all of the photos on the website are photos that I've taken, even like stock images. I'm very paranoid that I could get into legal problems if I use like a stock image. So I try to take everything that's on my website, it's all mine. I would say the biggest hassle really um, is people stealing my material. Every single day I see someone like plagiarize my blog. I see that someone used one of my photos without crediting, crediting me. At the end of the day, it's annoying, it's irritating. There are probably things that I could do, but I know it's just going to be an issue and that's the price of doing business online these days, unfortunately. So for all of you, even if you're just trying to share something, um, make sure you always try to tag the creator or if you don't know the creator, tag where you got it just to give credit where it's due. So um, legal issues, no, as long as you do your research. How did you know you needed to make privacy statements? Like at what point did you realize? Lots of Googling. Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. I forgot there's a delay. You go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, there's a slight delay. Sorry about that. If I interrupt anyone, um, I'll blame Zoom. Uh, so for that, I tried to keep up to date with 
internet things and you know with GoDaddy I do get their newsletter so all of the access um, the sources that I use I try to sign up for the newsletters because they're pretty good to say about upcoming law changes or anything like that I check the news I have a few like sources that I follow just to make sure I mean there could be things I'm missing but I try to just stay up to date with current events and as soon as I realize like something should be done I fix it immediately um, but no one is perfect. So we all just do the best we can, especially since I'm a clarinetist and not a web designer at the end of the day. Oh, here's a good one. Do I have liability insurance? Do you recommend it? Personally, no, I don't have liability for any of my digital content. Um, definitely like instrument insurance, yes, but for digital content, I don't. Um, that's not a bad idea, though, depending on what kind of resources you're producing, creating. Um, so that one, I would definitely look into that because you always want to make sure that you're covered with everything that you're creating. Just to speculate. Uh, we have a lot of different majors here. We have music ed and performance and BA and such. I think a lot of people think that this kind of self-promotion social media stuff is very much geared towards performance. Can you speculate what are some wonderful ways that uh, music education and BA students might utilize uh, this information to their advantage? Yes, everyone. Performance, I think that's the obvious choice for personal promotion, but education and like BAs, there are so many opportunities for recruitment. That's a really important one for any music program that you're teaching, whether it's elementary, middle, high school, university using social media, having a website, this is so great for recruitment because if you think about it, who are you going to choose for any product? Let's say you're trying to decide between dish detergents or something like that. You probably don't follow them on social media. Pretend you do. Are you going to go with the option that you've seen, you've heard of, you've like seen a few posts online, or are you going to go with the option that you've never heard of before? You always go with what you're familiar with. And so this personal promotion on social media is really great for recruitment, but it also allows everyone to see what you're about as an educator, what your philosophies are, what you think is the most important. The same for performance, some of my teaching philosophies, performance philosophies, um, sharing advice with other educators. There's so many forums and groups like discords for music educators that are sharing tips and tricks. There's um, a website I just discovered this year, Teachers Pay Teachers. I know a lot of people have really nice content that they share on there. So I think the opportunities are limited only to your imagination. And um, something else I want to say to everyone is just to get creative with the way that you choose to promote yourself. I learned a lot about social media, not by musicians because it, it was very rare for musicians to use social media the way they are today back in like the early 2000s. So I learned a lot from um, makeup artists on YouTube, beauty gurus, travel photographers, things like that, some of the ideas um, and the ways that they're promoting their content. I've taken that and then just adapted that for music. So I think everyone in every field, no matter what they're trying to create, I think social media is the way to go. So how would you suggest like getting started for at least like students like us that maybe don't have anything? Is there a point you would recommend starting with? Yes, I would start right now. And that's one of the, the biggest, um, not excuses, but things I hear. And I, I definitely get that it's valid. I think a lot of people feel like they have to wait to accomplish a certain milestone before they start. Like, I'm just a student, I'll wait until I graduate, I'll wait until I get a job, I'll wait until I get my doctorate, my master's, my bachelor's. And I think that the cool thing about social media is to see the inner lives of people and to sort of hear their stories. And I don't know about all of you, but I'm always much more compelled to see honest, true accounts. It's not as interesting to see like a polished, 
final result, if that makes any sense. That's, there's a time and a place for that, but I like seeing sort of the behind the scenes. And I think it's such a, a unique opportunity that you have to share your experiences as a music student, um, how you practice, what your class schedule looks like, what you learned in music history, why you don't like counterpoint or anything like that. Just sharing your experience with other people, because I think the world has a lot of professionals, but we don't necessarily have some of the younger students that are sharing what they're going through and helping with other people, even things like balancing, doing your assignments and then finding time to practice. I don't see enough of that. So um, start now to answer your question. And before you start, so if you decide you want to start right now, like I said earlier, I would try to do a little bit of brainstorming to figure out maybe the best platform to start and then maybe the best medium. So if you're really great at video editing and you know all about that software and you feel really confident in front of cameras, I would go with videos. If you're like me and you like books and writing and words and you don't like being in front of the camera all the time, maybe blogging or some other kind of like written content would be good. Or maybe a combination or maybe podcasting, maybe something else entirely, but sort of finding the best platform to house all of your ideas. And then before starting, I would say the third piece of advice I would give is to build up a little bit of a plan or a stockpile. Um, just so you can create a regular posting schedule. I would say that's a big mistake. I see a lot of people get really excited at the beginning. They do a few blog posts or a few like Instagram posts or they create a few pieces of content and then nothing for months because they get busy, life gets in the way. Um, but when I started the blog, I had 20, 25 articles already written. So I scheduled those just because if life got busy, then I would still have regular content just to keep getting more and more followers and audience and building all of that. So I hope that helps a little bit. Start now, please start now if this is something that interests you. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, you talked about how you've traveled all over the world and performed and like worked with people there. Um, how did you get into that? Or like, is it people you met through your blog or was it just like other means of meeting new people to get there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I have always been interested in travel, but I can't say that it was something that compelled me like it did when I moved to Paris. Um, the reason I moved to Paris is I was thinking about grad schools and I was thinking about teachers that I wanted to study with and Philippe Cooper was at the top of the list. So I took a lesson with him when he was in the States for a clarinet fest um, when it was in person, the, the good old days of in-person events, they'll come back soon, but it's very nice to reminisce about these in-person events now that everything is virtual. And I decided to move to Paris and study with him. And I was really lucky to receive a few scholarships for that. And it was just a life-changing experience because once I was over there, it sort of hit me that you can travel to all of these places. So I hadn't really planned on it, but everything was really inexpensive. They have really great budget airlines and trains in Europe. And I would just look at my schedule. The class was, um, the class schedule is a little bit different in Europe. So it's not like Monday through Friday classes. I might have two or three seminars a week, lessons, depending on when Philippe was available. So I would have like stretches of four or five days that I would just decide to see where a cheap flight was and then fly to Dublin for $10, which is true. They have very inexpensive airlines, um, fly to Amsterdam for the weekend. So along the way, I would post on social media, um, going to Amsterdam for the weekend. And some of these friends that I had made would say, oh, I'm in Amsterdam, um, let's grab a coffee. And this is where you have to be extremely, extremely careful. I'm not condoning meet up with random people from around the world because that doesn't always go so well. But the people that I did eventually meet in person, I could tell that they were actual people that played the clarinet. We had several mutual friends. Some of them, I would ask some of these mutual friends, like, is this person okay to meet up with? And so I would meet with different people. I remember there's a really wonderful um, girl from the Netherlands that studied at USC with Yehuda Galad. We met in Stockholm. So things like that, we would just hang out for the afternoon. I would get to learn about some of the places they had lived, um, get some travel tips along the way. And then some of it, I've met people through social media that I had yet to meet in real life. 
And your question made me immediately think of sort of a side journey I've had the last couple of years, and that is learning how to play the theremin. Has anyone here heard of this bizarre instrument? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yes, it's hands off, the only instrument that you play without touching it. And I've always known about it, it's a cool instrument. So a few years ago, I had a random thought, is there anything written for clarinet and theremin? did some research, spoiler alert, there's a lot. So I wrote a blog post with a few pieces I can find and I started getting messages from theremin players around the world. And um, one of them coincidentally was in Montreal where I was living at the time. I did my doctorate in Montreal. He was a French theremin player in Montreal. We met up, we started performing together for clarinet and theremin. He taught me how to play theremin. I've since been learning the instrument on my own. Um, so that was someone that I met from the internet and we've had a lot of really cool experiences performing together. We um, got written up by the CDC and we performed in Paris. Um, since then, I have met other theremin players online. I'm getting ready to record a piece um, that's been arranged for clarinet, theremin and piano for the virtual clarinet fest this year with another friend in the UK who I have yet to meet in real life, but we've done Zoom and Skype and we've met through the internet. So a lot of really opportunities, really cool opportunities like that, just because of social media. So um, to answer your question, yes, selectively choosing who to meet with, but also just being willing to engage with people, even if they are strangers, because I think there's a lot of great opportunities for friendships and for collaborations too. Just, just be careful. That's the most important thing I will say with that. Use common sense, use very good judgment um basic safety laws so be very careful when you do this if you do this what was the hardest thing for you for when you move to a new place when you go somewhere new what is the um what is the biggest challenge for you when you when you get there wow um so let me, let me, I'm trying to think. let me preference why I'm asking. A lot of these students have just moved to college for the first time. And in my experience, you get somewhere new and you're very alone. So what, what are some, when you go somewhere new, what is, what is challenging and how do you overcome it? I would say, um, just building connections. It's not, for me, it's not challenging. I sort of approach it as a game. And I have to say that um, I, I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this. I sort of embrace discomfort. Um, I like taking risks and I think that's one of those. So for me, it's exciting to go to new places and I miss my family and my friends, but the internet has made that so much easier. Um, but to build these networks, I would say that's the hardest part is just taking these leaps of faith and leaving your comfort zone yes that's what it is so i would say the hardest part is leaving your comfort zone and the only way to do that is to do that so try to reach out and find other clarinetists other musicians you have to go a little bit beyond what might make you comfortable um i know some people have a problem with like eating alone in public or like going to a restaurant or the movies alone or things like that and to practice being uncomfortable a little bit by doing some of these things and um, I think those are the ways that you meet people because if you go into like a, a clarinet concert alone, then of course you're going to meet other clarinet players, but it's how you choose to approach them. So being unafraid to go up and introduce yourself, um, reaching out, I would say that's the hardest thing at first, but once you do it, it becomes a lot easier. So just reaching out to people and trying to prevent this lonely period before you get there. I know before I went to Paris, I reached out to some like friends of friends of friends, and then I would be able to meet up with them when I got there. Um, the same in Montreal, I would go knowing just the teacher. I didn't know a soul in Paris. I didn't know a soul in Montreal. So I reached out to the teacher. I started going to concerts. I would just wander around, um, did a few like community classes, yoga, things like that. You meet people. Um, but being open to these new experiences and then using social media because that's actually how I met a lot of people is through social media. I see that they're in Montreal or in Paris and that's how I would meet up with people. Yeah, 
Um, you mentioned that you taught in Canada this past semester and that you've done similar things to that in the past. How exactly does that work? Are you working with the teacher at that school as like a guest teacher or how does that work? Yeah, exactly like that. So I was a sabbatical replacement at Iowa State and at Brandon University. So while they were taking sabbatical, I was teaching at the university. So that's why I was in Iowa and then Brandon. Sort of like a, a long-term substitute teacher. What are some opportunities that has come your way because, I mean, I know you've mentioned a lot, but what are, what are some opportunities that have come along because you promote yourself on social media, like professional opportunities? Ooh, um, so many. Well, the sabbatical replacements. I, I don't think I got that solely because of social media, but quite honestly, I think I had an advantage over people who were um, not as, I guess, prominent on social media because people, if they want to learn about me and maybe they're curious about my teaching style, then they could watch videos of me teaching or doing classes like these or my thoughts on articulation or embouchure or anything that's specific or more global. Um, I would say also just being able to travel some of these opportunities. I was really lucky when I was in Europe, I got to um, travel for fun, but also travel for performances a lot. I was in Germany for nearly a month on tour with an orchestra with musicians from 20 different countries. And I think that became because of social media, um, learning the theremin that was sort of a, a random coincidence because of um, an article that I wrote on social media that sort of snowballed into some of these other opportunities. So something small can turn into something more major. I'm trying to think of other opportunities I've had. Um, just random, random connections. It's usually something small that could lead to something much bigger. Something that I'm hoping that will open up is Europe soon because I am scheduled to do a residency in the Faroe Islands, which is a group of 18 islands between Scotland and Iceland. And I'm obsessed with the Faroe Islands. I discovered them on Instagram actually because I follow a lot of travel bloggers and photographers and I think it's a gorgeous place. So I was selected to do a residency in a remote village there. The village has like 60 people. Um, because of my website, I have been promoting online lessons and I started teaching a Welsh student and I was talking one day about the Faroe Islands and this Welsh student knows a clarinetist that lives in the Faroe Islands that I'm going to meet. So just one thing that sort of like builds into something else. So um, pay attention to all of these things that might seem insignificant, but that you can use to build upon and get even bigger opportunities. In a lot of ways, I think what we do is I keep saying, I'll look up the name for this. I don't know if it has a name, but if any of you look like The Office, that one episode where Dwight starts out with like a paper clip, which he trades for a pencil, which he trades for a stapler, and by the end, that's the sort of concept that I think that music works, is you start with something small, get it a little bit bigger, and then keep working your way until you have something substantial. I have one more question, if you have the time. Um... Everybody mm -hmm. has their own writing style and their own like brainstorming style. For you, how do you come up with ideas for your blog and what is your kind of writing process? Um, let's see. My writing process is a little bit erratic. So I would say the most important thing to do is just keep track of your ideas. My ideas come randomly, but usually when I'm teaching or practicing things that I'm telling a student and then I realize I wish more people knew this or you know, I think this is important. Um, I think more people should know this or um, questions that I have. So I, I read a lot of books. Like I said, I enjoy reading dissertations or, or things like this that I think are a little bit nerdy, but as I'm reading, I ask myself questions. Um, what music is written for clarinet and theremin? And then that's usually the topic of a blog post that I write. Uh, a lot of the ideas I get are thematic. So in March, I wrote a list of 101 pieces written by women composers featuring the clarinet. 
Um, they come from all over, but I would say to pay attention to your ideas because every single idea I have, whether I think it's good or garbage, I write down and I have a master list of all of the ideas I have organized by category. And then when it comes time to write a blog post, I'll look at this list and see what feels the most inspiring at the moment. Maybe I'm really excited about this one topic that I want to research. And so I research that and I usually write very quickly. So my writing process is to sort of get my thoughts on the paper. Don't worry about formatting or anything looking pretty, but everything that I'm thinking about the subject, just write down in a draft and then clean it up, add sources, add more resources, do a little more, bit more scholarly research. And then from there publish, I have gotten better. At first it was very haphazard. I would get an idea, get super excited, write it and publish it. And it'd be like I don't know, midnight or not prime engagement hours. So I've tried to restrain myself a little bit over the last few years to look at my Google analytics to make sure that maybe more people can engage with it when I do publish it. Um, and Google analytics is a really great resource if you do have a website. Um, Facebook, Instagram, they also have similar insights features where you can sort of see who your audience is, where your traffic is coming from. Google Analytics also has free courses that you can take. So I have taken the free um, beginner and advanced Google Analytics courses just so I know some of the capabilities it has. Um, and then past there, just really thinking that all of your ideas are worth exploring. Like I said, I write down some ideas and sometimes when I read them back, I think, what was I thinking? This is a terrible idea or this doesn't even make sense anymore. And that's okay because for every one of those bad ideas, I might've had five good ideas. So everything that you think of, even if it might not ultimately work out, just keep track of that on your phone, have like a notes app with all of your ideas or Dropbox or Google Drive or some, location where you can put all of these thoughts and then when you're feeling not inspired you can go there and hopefully get some inspiration thank you that's great advice mm -hmm. any other questions questions from home They could be anything. They don't have to be social media related or travel or anything like that. They could be clarinet. I mean, after all, we're all clarinet players, the greatest instrument around. <laughs> How, uh, uh, when are you recording your theremin clarinet? And you said piano, piano, theremin, and clarinet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're waiting on the when or what, sorry. When, sorry. When, um, the pianist is recording first. So the Thurman player, if anyone wants to look up, his name is Charlie Draper, which I think is funny since that's a very famous historical clarinet player. But um, the pianist and Thurman player are both in the UK. So we're doing a multi-track. The pianist is recording first and then Charlie is recording. So they're doing that this week. And after that, I'll record my part to it. Um, I won't give the specific piece. I'm really excited. Some people might think this is a little bit blasphemous, but we're doing a Brahms piece <laughs> arranged for clarinet, theremin, and piano. Oh, Great. <laughs> We've already pulled up his website. <laughs> oh yeah, Charlie. He also plays this other obscure instrument called the Ond Martineau, the, the Martineau waves, a very um, early electronic instrument. He does both, but you might find more theremin material. Uh, just a quick plug for all of you, the uh, Clarinet Fest is virtual this year over the summer and it's free to register and you don't have to be a member if you don't want to. There's lots of cool stuff. I, I sent in my registration soon so I can email that out to the students. But if you're not a student here, register for that. There's going to be a lot of cool stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, so I asked you before this all started about what's next. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the residencies. Can you tell us uh, real quick, just a little bit, what is a residency? So yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, residencies, they're usually, they're, they seem to be more common with 
artist or like painter kind of artist, even though we are a musical artist. And I started researching these a lot when I was living in Paris, just because where I lived, um, the United States Foundation, I was in, it's sort of a glorified dorm setting, but the top floor of the building I was in was all for artists, musicians. We had painters, dancers, mimes, photographers, every kind of creative pursuit. And so I was always hearing about these residencies and there are some that are specific for music, but it seems to be generally geared towards um, like more hands-on like painting and things. So I've done a lot of research and applied for a lot of residencies. And it's just a period of time where you will go to a location and typically complete a project. And the parameters vary. Some of them, they're very open. Why do you want to come here? And you could do anything but some, they have to be relative to a theme. Um, one that I applied for and I did not get, I was very disappointed. It was a residency on a train that was traveling from Finland to Japan through Russia. It was going to go across several different countries and it was promoting ecotourism. So as you might imagine, that's a little bit harder to spin why the clarinet can help with ecotourism. There's definitely a lot of ways, but some of them, some other art forms might be better suited to that. Um, that's just one example. I saw another one that I ultimately didn't apply to for residencies, you have to be careful. You want to go for the ones where they pay you, not the residencies where you have to pay to do the residency. But there was one where it was a three week sailing expedition in Svalbard, which is north, 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 like close to the Arctic Circle. And the I thought that it would be a paid opportunity, but you would end up having to pay $9,000 <laughs> to do this. So. Um, you have to be selective when you're applying for residencies, but I think it's a really great way to do some projects. Um, another one that I have at some point to be determined next year is in Austria for three months and I'll be studying the music of Ernst Krennig. And the reason I'm doing that when I was applying for that, it's in this small town outside of Vienna. And I was looking at the partners for this residency and one was the Ernst Krennig Museum. So when it came time to write my application, I felt that would be a good tie-in. So if any of you start applying for residencies, always try to look and see what the parameters are, if there's any themes, and then try to stick to those really closely for a better chance of being selected. Any other questions? I think they're all fading. <laughs> Yeah, I know this is a tough time of day. Um, just a few uh, things. Uh, actually, this Sunday, I'm going to do a quick recorded interview with Dr. McClay about her experiences with social media and self-promotion because the social media committee is doing, uh, what is it, May the Marketing Be With You this month. <laughs> And so I'll, that'll be released on the ICA YouTube page. So you can hear a little bit more, or if you think of something that you'd like to ask, you can email me between now and maybe let's say Friday so that she has time to review the questions. I can include those questions um, as well. Uh, I've learned so much from you just in, you know, just being on the social media committee uh, just since November or December, wherever, whenever we started. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, the time you, you spent coming in and chatting with us today. Thank you. This has been really great. And thank you all. And you all have such a wonderful teacher. She's amazing. It does so many great things for the clarinet world, for the ICA too, but the clarinet community. So you should all feel very, very thankful for your amazing teacher. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're so sweet. Um, yeah, so, um, any last, last call, last call? All right, well, thank you so much. It was so great. Good. Oh, thank somebody, you. Uh, oh, I uh, just... oh, there's a social media plug. This is perfect. Plug for Etude of the Week, Clarinet Edition Group on Facebook. We just started the Artie Shaw Etudes. Uh, join in with us. I'd love to do that. Uh, plug for our studio. We had our studio recital last Friday. It's still up. My recital is on Friday at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Um, people who are students here, that is required. <laughs> you must come. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's all the announcements. We had a wonderful masterclass series, and it's great to have you as the final guest. So thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you all. This has been so great. Go out and continue sharing your art with the world. I think you're all amazing and I have so much respect for everyone. Oh, thank you so much. So I will see you um, Sunday. The rest of you follow her on social media. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'll have a good evening and I'll see you Sunday. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.